Hi, it's Illumina Sars, and this video will tackle the IB Psychology Learning Outcomes, outline principles that define the biological level of analysis, and explain how principles that define the biological level of analysis may be demonstrated in research. For the first learning outcome, focus on the principles, but make sure to mention the studies briefly, and for the second learning outcome, focus on the studies, but mention the principles as well. The command term outline means to give a brief account or summary, which means it is a short answer question or an SAQ, which means it will only come up in section A of paper 1. In addition, there are three principles that define the biological level of analysis, but it is rarely the case that the question asks you to outline three principles, so I advise you to know two really well and just know that the other principle exists, aka know the principle and know a study that corresponds to the principle. Lastly, if it says outline one principle, please just outline one. They will only grade the first principle they see. Okay, so now that I got the little things aside, let's get on with the principles. And by the little things, I mean knowing these things before you study is a must. So the first principle states that they are biological correlates of behavior. For instance, certain neurotransmitters or hormones have an effect on our behavior. We can also connect this to localization of function in the brain, which is another learning outcome in the biological level of analysis, which suggests each area of the brain is responsible for coordinating a certain part of our body and or nervous system, thus affecting our behavior. And the biological level of analysis is based on reductionism, which attempts to explain complex behavior in terms of simple causes. For instance, we may just link the hippocampus to spatial memory, when in reality, many other factors can affect spatial memory as well. The first study that corresponds to Principle 1 is a study done by McGuire et al., and it is most commonly known as the London Taxi Driver Study. It was conducted in the year 2000, and it investigated whether or not the hippocampus plays a role in spatial memory. London taxi drivers were used as participants because their job requires extensive spatial navigational skills. So, if their brains are compared to the brains of non-taxi drivers, we can see which part of the brain is more developed or activated when spatial navigational skills are used. So the brains of healthy, right-handed male licensed London taxi drivers were compared to the brains of healthy, right-handed males who did not drive taxis by using an MRI scan. The MRI scan showed more gray matter in the posterior hippocampus of the taxi drivers compared to the control group, while the anterior hippocampus was larger in control subjects than the taxi drivers. The overall hippocampal volume correlated with the amount of time spent as a taxi driver. This study therefore shows the link between the hippocampus and spatial navigational skills, thus showing the link between the anatomy of the brain and behavior. These are some other studies you can possibly use for principle one. Now the next principle is animal research can provide insight into human behavior. Because ethical boundaries do not really allow people's brains or body chemistry to be messed around too much, animal research is used. Though there are ethical considerations in animal research, animal studies are usually approved by the ethics board given that it is of benefit for humans. And in the biological level of analysis, studies on animals are often generalized to humans as well. So a study that corresponds to principle two is a study by Rosenzweig, Bennett, and Diamond in 1972. So the aim of the study was to investigate whether environmental factors affect the development of neurons. So the researchers placed rats in either an enriched environment or an impoverished condition. In the enriched environments, 10 to 12 rats were put in a cage with different stimulus objects to play with. This group also received maze training. In the impoverished condition, each rat was placed in an individual cage where they were given no stimulus. The rats spent 30 to 60 days in their respective environments before they were killed so that their brain anatomy could be studied. The results showed that the anatomy of the brain was different for rats in the enriched environment and the impoverished environment. The brains of rats in the enriched environment had increased thickness and higher weight in the cerebral cortex. And sorry about my spelling mistake in thickness. <laughs> um, and also there are more acetylcholine receptors in brains of rats in the enriched condition. So this study showed that the environment plays a huge role in the development of neurons. These are some other studies you can possibly use for principle two. Next is principle three. It states that human behavior is to some extent genetically based. 
This just means that we were born with certain traits. And research on twins or family studies can provide insight into the genetic elements that lead to behaviors such as personality or intelligence, or mental disorders such as depression or schizophrenia. These twin studies are useful because monozygotic twins share 100% of genes and dizygotic twins share 50% of genes. This can show the extent of the environment or the effect of genetics on behavior. But um, when we look at twin research, they never show a 100% concordance rate. This shows that though they share 100% of genes, they don't have a 100% concordance rate, which means that environmental factors do play a role, and the role can be small or big. So this shows that um, the genetics is only a predisposition, but not a cause. The last study we will look at today is a study done by Bouchard et al. in 1990, and it is also called the Minnesota Twin Study. It was a longitudinal study that investigated the role of genes in intelligence. The study used a sample of monozygotic twins that were reared together and monozygotic twins that were reared apart. The independent variable is therefore the fact that the monozygotic twins were reared together or apart. Since monozygotic twins share 100% of genes, if they are reared together and have a high concordance rate, or how much of the same trait these twins have, this shows the likelihood of the environment playing an effect on intelligence, and if they are reared apart and have a high concordance rate, this shows the likelihood of genetics playing a role in intelligence. If we see in the results, the monozygotic twins reared together had a concordance rate of 86%, and the monozygotic twins reared apart had a concordance rate of 69%. So the twins reared together had a higher concordance rate, which means there is a high chance that genetics plays a role in intelligence. However, Though this shows a link between genetic inheritance and intelligence, it does not rule out the role of the environment. And here are some other studies that you can use for principle 3. So thank you so much for watching this video. I haven't posted in a while. I actually finished my exams this May, so I was just taking a break. So if you guys have any questions um, regarding IB, feel free to ask me. <laughs> and yeah, I'll see you guys in my next video. Bye!